feels as if it's already week three, but it's actually just week two. And week two is on this series is Going Pains. And I've, that's the title of the whole series. And it talks about radical obedience, radical transformation, and radical urgency. There's a whole heap of things. And what enabled this whole series is to see how did the church cope with the challenges that they were facing. I mean, as a new church, they were a small church and they it just exploded. And they were growing numerically and they were growing you know, physical in numbers, but they faced a number of challenges. And the first challenge that we're going to look in this morning is opposition from the outside. That was the first, one of the first challenges. And over the course of the next few weeks, we'll look at all the other. I've just identified five in this part. So this morning, we, we kind of read chapter 4, and we're going to read 31 verses together because that's the whole package. Um, you cannot just read them apart. And interesting enough, if we come to verse 11, just see whether you can recognize, you know, it was shown here on that um, screen, and I had no inquiry that. Um, you know, this, on the YouTube clip, it said there, he is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. That's quite interesting. That was in Matthew, but it's the same words that was quoted, but it was it's, it's not an accident, but it's coincidental that it's, you know, the same Sunday. So, yeah, there, there is no accident. Everything is predetermined in that sense. So, let us, let us just start. Lord, I pray that as we read your word, that you will speak to our hearts. That we are reminded that the one who speaks today is merely a vehicle. It's an instrument. Lord, that there is actually no difference between us. But Lord, that this will all be a glorifying you. And that we will be reminded that it's your spirit that transforms. That we will submit to the rule to you of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I thank you that you have made yourself known to us. So when we read from Acts 4, if I can just fill you in. Now, you know that the new church has started. Jesus surrendered. The Pentecost came. It was took place. The Spirit came down. Peter stood up in the front of the crowd. He preached the, the sermon. 3,000 people became Christian and they started to follow Christ. And we actually, that builds into the foundation of this church. We say, that there are four components that is so evident in Acts 2 of the, the fellowship, which was the, the commitment to teaching, to prayer, serving and fellowship. And none, you know, we all say that some, we can't put the one to the other. It's like four legs on a table. How many of you would sit on a chair with three legs? If I take one of those out, you would not like it. We used to do that in our at our residence where we wanted it to, one of the legs was broken. So we put it out and we wait for people to come and sit. And that just proved my point that every time someone sat on it, it just like, wow, fell right back. I was one of them for many times. Point is, four, four components that were part of this church and crucial, critical. So here we have it. Peter went out and John and he, he healed the cripple. He just healed the man who was unable to walk. He said, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. And this guy was obviously very excited to walk. I mean, imagine 40 years of being able to walk and all of a sudden someone said, stand up. I think you'll be glad to use your legs. And now, with the church growing, with all, and all this is still in Jerusalem and around. It's, they're still around the temple and this excitement is just exploding. It's, just this heap of energy going. And he came to attention. This is where the story starts. Peter and, uh, and John. Chapter 4 verse 1. The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter. Because all of this that has taken place just now was just in front of the temple. And in the temple and out of the temple. So you can imagine the commotion. So they came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. Because they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John because it was evening 
And because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. You can imagine it's much more than 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. And as the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family, they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, By what power or what name did you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this. And all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. And then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourself whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them, because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. We just paused there for a week, but in a, in a moment. My question this morning, if we look at and we are being warned that persecution will always follow faith, will always look like foolishness to others, my question is this, if we are not experiencing any resistance, is that because everyone except us as followers of Jesus Christ, or is it perhaps because we do not look any different from them. Just pause on this. This is not a threat. It's not a, this is just a question of light. This whole week was, as I prepared for the series, and Friday night we went to this open doors, and these people look completely different. Once they accept the Christ, they look completely different than those around them. We saw a video of the guys in India, and they moved away from Hinduism, and all of a sudden, they are being persecuted. The question is, in my heart, is say, well, when I speak to people, we say, thank you, Lord, for the freedom we have to express our faith here. Are we not facing any persecution? My hypothesis is that, in fact, we do. We really do. If someone walks in here today and he puts a gun against your head and he said, what are you confessing? 
Or are you a Christian? What will you say? It's a very dangerous question because when there is no real gun, even if I, I thought what, what fun would it have been if I organized troops and they stormed in here and you know do a real life action event, that would have been amazing. But it's 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 very hard to say, yes, that's what I'll do. Because the trap is, before I start today, the trap is that, and I will get back to Peter, he did exactly the same, Lord, I will be with you, I will. And he had to learn that it's not I will, but God will through me. Big difference. There was the story told about this in the communist times in, um, in Russia. You were not allowed to have a Bible, you were not allowed to be a Christian if, they, if you get caught. The area of Siberia or wherever that you would get punished or disappear or be killed or it was not a very very happy ending if they you know catch you if you get caught anyway so here we there was a, there was a group that was secretly meeting and all of a sudden burst in burst two uh, uh, soldiers they burst in and they said who of you are Christians and obviously everybody looked at them and said look I will give you an opportunity. If you're not a Christian, you can now actually stand up and go, and you will face no repercussion. And more than half left. And once they left, they closed the doors, and these others were petrified because they knew what was going to, going to happen now. In debt. And then once they closed the door, the two guards took out their Bibles and said, Well, we needed to know who we can trust. The point is, is that for us here to face is today we look at, 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 at an happening where this new church, this new movement has been growing rapidly and pretty quickly in this growing pains they face their first opposition. They face their first challenge, how to deal with opposition and what will they do when the voice of the enemy tells them to be quiet. Radical obedience is the transformation through the Holy Spirit. And I want to say this morning, without radical obedience, no of the others will follow. Without the radical obedience, there will be no radical mission or radical urgency or radical whatever you want to put in. Without the radical obedience, we always see how that transforms people. Think about this. What is the difference between putting on a bathing suit and swimming? If you put on your bathing suit and you sit next to the pool, are you immersed? You're not. You're sitting on the side. You're getting, you know, you're still warm. You're outside of the pool. It's only when you fall in, jump in, or whatever way, you know, when you're immersed, when you actually can say, I am now swimming and this is the whole point of this morning it, and I've, I've taken a little bit of a long time to get in and you might have think ah oh, you know it's not getting to the point but for you to understand what is happening here I had to bring around a point and say where do we start what enable this all to take place and firstly when we look at the story we see now that this church went out and Peter stood up and gave that brand new sermon and people became um, they became followers of Christ and now at the temple, they just, just outside the temple, they healed this man. And obviously this man, he was 40 years old, he was very, very happy to be able to walk now. And he was following, he was praising God. And all of a sudden we see the first resistance. And that is my first point this morning is that when we are true followers of Christ, when the radical obedience that whole of our heart is transformation, you will face resistance that is a fact and if you're not facing that resistance you've got to be very very mindful because you will look different but here we have we have this uh, people come from the Sanhedrin and they grab Peter and John and it seems like they grab this uh, this guy who could walk and they off and they and now this whole conversation in fault it's like a court case they say by what name are you preaching? By what name are you talking about? And Peter stood up and he said, 
No other name than Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, think about that for a second. What enabled Peter to do that? Just think about the radical obedience and the radical transformation of Peter. Because this same Peter said to Jesus, I will walk with you. I will be with you. And Peter and Jesus said, well, get away from me, Satan. And this same Peter with this big mouth and this great in initiative, when the moment came to speak up, remember when he stood down in a fire and this poor servant girl looked at him and said, hey, you're part of Jesus. Remember what Peter did? He was said, yes, yes. No. He swore, I do not know this man. I'm not, I don't know, know what you're talking about. The first point is that for Peter to be able to stand up and do this, it was the radical transformation by the Spirit that was needed. So what I'm saying to you this morning is for us to be radically obedient for all of that is because of the Holy Spirit. It is because of the transformational power that change our lives. I'm not standing here because I am good. I'm not good. All by the Spirit. I am a vehicle. And once Peter experienced that, when his perspective was changed to the Holy Spirit, he stood up without fear in front of the same crowd and crucified Jesus. I mean, these are the same Sanhedrin. They didn't change. It was the same guys. And they said, look, what are you saying now? They, they wanted to know. They were amazed. You see the words used. They were amazed at the about this courage of these men. What are you doing? And again in verse 8 there, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. He was able to do that. And that is something which I find extremely important. It is what I'm saying. It's not about what I, I don't want you to go out and do things. It's that not the point. The point is, to be able to do that, you need the transformation through the Holy Spirit. It allows the Spirit. That surrender, when we sing that song, we thought I surrender all so that you can speak through me. That's a good start. But now, my point takes just a step backwards. Without the radical obedience, nothing else can follow. You see, the Western spin these days on the thing about following Christ is, you know I love Jesus. We all love Jesus and Jesus loves me and therefore I can serve Jesus as I want to. The spin says that as long as Jesus fits into your schedule, you can serve Him. That's a great option. Think about it. That's the way that it's about us. When we waste the world, it's all about my comfort. About me, my achievements, my success. The one guy wrote a controversial book and he said, it's because of that that we see people have less and less children. Because the days when children were there to enhance your richness has gone. Today, children need to enhance your lifestyle. So we put faith into enhancing our lifestyle. Now that seems a bit radical, but I, the point I'm trying to make here this morning is simply this, is did we lose the true fear of God? You see, radical obedience starts when way back in Acts, way back in, in Exodus. And in Exodus, we see that these people came out, Jesus, our God, saved them, and they stood there and God says, look, for you to be my people, for you to be holy, for you to experience the joy and the blessing, I need to set up the ground rules. This is who I am. And I am holy, perfect. And being perfect, this is the way that you and I will have this relationship. And He gave us the Ten Commandments. He gave us ground rules. And you see, when he did that, God said, look, I'm coming to you. But the people were so afraid. They feared because all of a sudden they see God and they, they realized they were cut to a heart in fear. They melted off in fear because of this. They couldn't come closer. What I'm saying is not again. It's not about how good you are in obeying the Ten Commandments because we've all fallen short of glory. But the radical obedience is now not to say, look, Jesus, I can serve you as I want to because you will love me anyway. But say, Lord, you love me anyway. Therefore, I want to fall in within this ground rules. I want to obey you. Lord, the Holy Spirit has cut me to the heart. 
You see, the church didn't start in Rome before they were cut to the heart. Because after he Peter's first sermon, they looked at him and said, what shall we do? And they were cut to the heart. And in that response, and this is my word and my challenge to you this morning, is that radical obedience, this whole transformational process, grows within a radical obedience. We are, we are different than those around us. But you see, once you've done that, you will look different, even to those that are safe of the same culture, of the same people, or look the same in. Peter and John were the same group of people, part of the Jewish community. They were no different when they were interviewed by these guys. And they tell him, look, you can serve, because these people said, look, you should stop talking about Jesus. And they said, you can do what you want in front of God's eyes, but we will obey God. Talking about that, do you realize what the world has accomplished? They've accomplished the goal of letting us keep quiet for the sake of peace and harmony. Now I'm not saying that we should be going out there and burning tires and screaming and that's the, the word makes it clear, live in harmony as far as you can. But your obedience is to God first. The world is succeeding in quieting us down. The world is succeeding in convincing us that faith should not be, or religion, or my, what I believe in should not be discussed openly. That it should be somewhere private. So when you are, if you're a Christian and you're among Christian friends, that's okay. Don't bring it into the world outside. We do not need that. Everybody for yourself. I think the world is trying to, you know, they want to succeed and they want to quiet us down. And look at the words in verse 18 it says there and then they called in again and they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus everywhere all around look at the state schools look at your work you are commanded you shall not talk about the word of God you shall not live as a Christian you shall not do as a Christian you shall live as the rest of the world now and this is the question of radical obedience Peter and John replied, Judge for yourself whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. And that's a question. That's a hard question. Have you noticed? The world doesn't mind any religious teaching. Any religious teaching. As long as it is not about Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I can take any teaching to anyone. I can take any teaching and it would probably be accepted. But bring the word of Jesus into any conversation and I can guarantee you there will be resistance. I can guarantee you there will be objection. Think about that. The persecuted church out there, and we pray for them, they made a radical decision to follow Christ. But you see the difficulty, what they have, or they, what, what makes it easier for them is they know the enemy. <coughs> they know, okay, I'm standing on this side, and those guys are against me. And they know that even my brother, who has been still a Hindu or a Muslim, if, he, if I get caught, he will kill me. That's a fact. And it's hard. And I'm not, I'm not downplaying it. it. It's hard. But what makes it harder for us in the Western world, is that we are supposedly free to do as we believe. But let me tell you, radical obedience will cause resistance. Think about it. If you obey God, you just look at the Ten Commandments. If you, as a young man, a young woman, tells the world that I will not indulge in any sexual relationship until I get married, I will not steal, I will not gossip, I will not do, I can tell you, you will face resistance. Think about it. If you obey the ground rules of God, in fear of God, you will face resistance. Because the world, although they are moral people, they do not accept the angry moral mode of God. That's hard. But without surrender, it might be hard for you as well. I have noted that many times we, we don't want our kids to be persecuted. And 
I want the best for my kids. I don't say I want them to be shot and do this. Absolutely. Mm. But I have to ask myself, is that what I want? Or is that what God wants? And it's quite a challenge. It challenges I'm challenged as I stand and speak to you because sometimes I realize that I am as guilty. I want to challenge my kids, but at the same time, oh no, I don't want them to be having any difficulty at school. It is a battle. But at the end, the question is, who should be obey? Yes, we should live peaceful lives. We should seek the peace of the country. We should pray for our enemy. We should pray for our, the people in power and the government. That's absolutely true. But I can guarantee you that there will be no radical mission or urgency unless it starts with radical obedience. And I can guarantee you radical obedience to the ground rules of God, holding on to His faith, His truth, His love, will make you a persecuted person. And therefore, the words are here. Listen to this. Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. <laughs> And then they were released and at the, when they returned they immediately didn't go into one sulking uh, revenge planning attack. Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, look at this, they were not saying, and now I'm going to make a bomb, I'm going to make this and that, I'm going to get them back, I'm going to do this. No. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer and said, Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit in the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why did the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And after they prayed, the place they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. For us, as the Pioneer Community Church, this corporate gathering, for us as a group of people, believers, no matter where you are now and in the future, to be able to speak the word boldly is to pray for boldness through the Holy Spirit. I pray that we will be marked by the boldness to stand up. Stand up for those who are lonely and isolated. Stand up to serve them coffee. Stand up to have fellowship. Stand up to do all of these things. But above all, stand up in the name of Jesus Christ for the sake of the glory of God. There is no other name. Can I, as I conclude here, really ask let us obey God rather than men. Jesus, this is our prayer. And Lord, just take this meek and word of that was delivered today. Lord, you are so powerful in our lives. And Lord, you know how to, in who you want this message to be heard to and grow on. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that it is a problem of us that we can praise you, that we can be bold. Being a light on the hill is a bold thing to have 
it is visible. It's visible to friends and enemies. So Jesus, I pray that we will not be afraid, that we will hear you and not man. Give us courage. Give us boldness for the sake of your glory and your name. Amen.